we are only three days in and my head is already spinning. Welcome everyone to my coverage of the 2021 G1 Climax Tournament. I am of course your host, the natural Chris Black of the Saturday Night Slamcasters podcast, independent professional wrestler, and everybody's favorite narcissist. Woo, we are back to the A block for night three of the G1 Climax Tournament and things are beginning to heat up. Before I begin though, let me remind you, my prediction video is up on this channel. Link is in the descriptions. I break down who I feel is going to win each of the blocks as well as who will win overall. In addition to that, I also cover who I think is going to be the biggest losers in each block and matches that I look forward to seeing. So with that out the way, let's get into the action. So tonight we start out without any undercard matches. We get straight to the tournament. Match number one, we have the Silverback, Tangaloa, defeating Yuji Nagata. Yuji Nagata is stepping in for Naito. As we know, Naito had to withdraw from the tournament due to an injury. So this is kind of an exhibition match because Tangaloa has two points due to the forfeit of Tetsuya Naito. So Nagata, he made him work for these forfeited points. This was not an easy win. The story of this match is pretty much younger opponent thinking that their age gives them an automatic advantage, but the veteran's experience is their advantage. Once Tonga got the upper hand, he was able to wrestle his type of match, being much more physically dominant than Nagata. Nagata, however, he's fighting back, staying alive by going after the leg and matching Tonga's physicality. Nagata tries to submit Tangaloa with a heel hook. But Tanga was able to put Nagata into a cross face. However, he escaped and put on the ankle lock and then transitioned into a Nagata lock. A Nagata leg lock, they had to specify that. Once again, this was not an easy match by any means. And if it wasn't a tournament match, one could think Nagata could have actually beat him. But that didn't happen. After a hard fought match, Nagata eventually is pinned by Tangaloa. Tangaloa. Well, I would say he picked up two points, but he already did. So, Tangaloa wins. Match number two, we have the Great Okan defeating Toro Yano. And in the last encounter between these two in the New Japan Cup, Okan ended up having to cut his hair, which was tied to the barricade in order to avoid elimination. So, he's kind of used to Yano's shenanigans. Yano comes out. And Okan stands in the ring holding up the lock of hair, which I can't believe he still held on to since March. Yano was pleading and apologizing from the ramp, but Okan doesn't want to hear any of it and goes on the attack on the outside. So we don't get any long Yano introduction in this match. Hell, he didn't even have time to take off his entrance gear. But you know, Yano's no chump and he fights back, but the fury of Okan just simply overwhelms his defense. Yano should have channeled his badass persona like he did against Chase Owens. Great Okan tried to get Yano to kiss his boot with the braid sitting on top, but Yano was able to escape and tries to frustrate Okan, which worked for a quick second. Okan pulls out the handcuffs and attempts to lock Yano to the barricade, but Yano avoids this and throws the handcuffs into the crowd. We get a little bit of corner pad shenanigans as we normally do with Yano. The ref <laughs> he gets hit by it by accident, of course, but he sells it like it's a chair shot. Boy, this allows for the fight to go on to the outside and Yano gets handcuffed with his own pair of cuffs. But we all know Yano has always got a trick up his sleeve. He takes out his own key, but then that's taken by Great Okan. And in order to escape, he has to tear apart and unhook the barricade in order to escape just in time. But after all that, he still gets hit with the Eliminator. Yano is out. Great Okan picks up two more points. In the third match, we have Kenta defeating Yujiro Takahashi. So we have regular Bullet Club versus the House of Torture. This should be interesting. I feel the dynamic of this match was pretty interesting because if you listen to my predictions video, I think there's going to be some drama going down between the House of Torture and Bullet Club. Kenta goes for the too sweet, but Yujiro just walks away. He's not trying to show any love to Kenta. Kenta is having a hard time at first with Yano. And again, I ask myself, what the fuck am I watching? Kenta eventually gains the upper hand on the outside. And at the count of 17, he pretty much has Yujiro beat. 
but he decides to throw him back in. So not so sure about that spot. I probably would not have done that if I was booking. Finally, we get to see the usual Kenta, who begins to just take apart Yujiro. But that didn't even last long. Yujiro regains control shortly afterwards. So now this match kicks into second gear, but I'm beginning to lose interest. I can't believe how Yujiro is beginning to look like a threat this year. And, and my God, this Marty ref is really bad at near falls. He counts one, he counts two, and there's a big delay before the kick out. It's really obvious. I've noticed this for some time now that this Marty ref, he just is not that good at near falls. He makes it look very staged and get it together. After some more back and forth action, we get a bunch of unrealistic counters by Yujiro and Kenta taps Yujiro, Yujiro with the game over submission. Yujiro then offers up the two sweet and Kenta does it and they embrace. So I don't know, take that as you will. I still think there's some drama that's brewing between these two groups. All right, match number four. Kota Ibushi defeats Tomohiro Ishii. Ishii right away showing that he has the strength advantage starts dishing out the punishment onto Ibushi. Shoulder tackles him. He's chopping him, talking shit. Ishii is feeling real extra confident, it seems. As they start trading slaps, I mean, open hand slaps to the face, Ibushi finally puts Ishii down with a stiff kick right to the chest. This gives Ibushi control of the match for a very short period. Ishii nails that nice delayed suplex off the second rope. Ibushi, realizing that he has to bring it to Ishii, starts dialing it up a bit, trying to beat Ishii in a striking match. Ishii blocks a Kamagoye attempt, eats a kick right to the head, pops up, and then headbutts the shit out of Ibushi. And dude is down for the count. As we pass the 15 minute mark, both men just look totally sped, both unable to capitalize after putting the other man down. They both fight back up. Ibushi nails a knee to the chin, goes for a Kamagoye, is blocked by a headbutt to the gut, but then he hits it while standing up because he was holding on to the arms and then follows it up with a normal Kamagoye once Ishii hit his knees and he gets the pin. So Ibushi earns his first two points in the tournament. And in our main event, my God, you know, okay. So Zack Saber Jr. defeats Shingo Takaki. My God, this match was spoiled. Now, usually I try to avoid any type of spoilers before I get a chance to watch these matches. And as I'm scrolling through Facebook, I see one of my Facebook groups, someone posts, Zack Sabre Jr. taps out Shingo. So I was kind of spoiled walking into his match, but it was still a good match. So it didn't really ruin it, ruin it for me. The commentators state that Shingo in his last two G1 tournaments have only earned eight points. Meanwhile, Zack Sabre Jr. has averaged 10 in his last four G1 tournament appearances. Shingo at first tries to wrestle with Zack at the start, which Zack is very comfortable with, and it shows. It's not until he throws his weight around before Shingo gets Zack to bail out the ring. Shingo actually tries to go hold for hold with Zack, which I wouldn't recommend, and is in control for a little bit, Zack quickly realized that he couldn't match his strength and would have to go with more technique. Uh, Kevin Kelly, possibly spoiling some more shit, asks, why has it been so long since a champion has won the tournament? Which could be him foreshadowing a Shingo tournament win. Again, take a listen to my prediction video. Zack gets away and does that neck twist thing with his legs and drops kick Shingo right to the head, getting back in control of the match. Zack then goes on a strike attack with some European uppercuts and kicks to the face. Zack, looking to pick the target, now goes after Shingo's neck. Shingo's able to fire up his strikes. Man, they look—they got so much power behind them. When Zack tries to strike back, he's knifed. He's knocked right back on his ass. Zack, being the technical master that he is, however, can turn things around rather quickly if he grabs hold of a limb. Shingo even tries an STF to submit Zack, but he's able to get to the rope. They start trading pin attempts. Man, I love Zack's European clutch pin. That's such a thing of beauty, but Shingo kicks out of that one. So as we pass the 20 minute mark, Zack locks in the Clarky Cat. Shingo is in the middle of the ring. 
I'm thinking this must be it, but then he's able to roll to the ropes for the break. Zack starts striking the neck like Naito, softening it up for the submission. Zack is put in a made of Japan, but kicks out at the five minute mark, only to get leveled by a pumping bomber, but Shingo is too tired to capitalize and try to get the pin. Zack is able to escape three attempts of the last of the dragon and is able to hook his arms on the third, bringing Shingo down. He transitions over into a triangle right in the middle of the ring with three minutes left. Zack wrenches back on the arm and surprise, surprise, Shingo taps out, which, okay, I, I get it. It's early in the tournament. It's not a bad decision by Shingo storyline wise. I would rather tap out instead of risk further injury and have to lose or forfeit the later matches. So it's probably a smart thing that Shingo went ahead and tapped out. So, all right, at the end of night three, the points are as follows. Of course, Tetsuya Naito is out of the tournament. Tomohiro Ishii sitting at zero. We have Yujiro Takahashi, Toro Yano, Shingo Takaki, Kenta, Koto Ibushi, and Tangaloa all tied at two points. The Great Okan and Zack Sabre Jr. at the top with four. Now, of course, with these points, I'm only including the two points that they earned from Naito the night that they were supposed to wrestle. I'm not going to automatically give everybody two points because that's just going to start confusing things. So I'm just pretending it as if Naito is still in the tournament. So when they have their match with them or the replacement match with them, that's when I'll add their two points to the score. So that's going to be about it. So I believe it's time to take it home. I'm trying to not have these videos last too long. If you are enjoying my coverage of the G1 Climax Tournament, be sure to hit that subscribe button. My goal is to get to 100 subscribers by the end of this tournament. And the only way I'm going to reach that goal is if you go ahead and hit the subscribe button. I'm going to give you a second to do that right now. You can find me on all social media. Links are in my description. That'll take you to my Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter pages. And while you're at it, will not you go ahead and show the Saturday Night Slamcasters podcast some love? In my description, you will find links to the Saturday Night Slamcasters podcasting page, the Saturday Night Slamcasters Facebook page, Facebook group, and we also have a YouTube channel. So don't forget to show us some love and subscribe to that as well. We have all of our bonus content on our YouTube channel, which is separate content from our normal podcast. I want to thank you all for tuning in to my continued coverage of the 2021 G1 Climax. I will be back with my review of Night 4. Come get slammed.